The Tom Woods Show, episode 692. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if your email inbox is running your life, it's time to get your sanity back. Do what I do and use SaneBox. That's S-A-N-E-B-O-X. Get a 14-day free trial at SaneBox.com slash Woods. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. Today, we're talking about the 28 pages. Do you know what the 28 pages are? Well, you will after this episode if you don't already. The 28 pages are an entire section within an official report of a joint inquiry conducted by the House and Senate Intelligence Committees published in December 2002. This entire section has been blacked out. Now, some people have been allowed to read this section. This is a sec- This is about 9-11. And some people, like U.S. congressmen, for example, have been permitted to read these 28 pages, and apparently they have something to do with a government or governments that may have lent some assistance to the 9-11 attackers. So it's, of course, an interesting subject, and Senator Rand Paul has been behind an effort to declassify the 28 pages. So we're going to talk about the 28 pages and the controversy surrounding them, and we're going to do so with Brian McGlinchey, who runs 28pages.org. That's 28pages.org. He is a freelance writer. He's the founder of 28pages.org. He's a former Army officer and a financial services executive, and he joins me right now to talk about the 28 pages. Brian, thanks for being here. It's great to be with you, Tom. I've been reading 28pages.org since I knew we were going to talk. I knew a little something about this 28-page thing, but not a whole lot. I was quite surprised by the comments by Thomas Massey, Congressman Massey from Kentucky. You know, he's a pretty sober and, uh, you know, restrained individual in his rhetoric, and he is blown away by the contents of the 28 pages. Let's start off with what these 28 pages actually are. These are not pages uh, redacted from the uh, the 9-11 Commission report. I bet I think people probably think that's the case. What are these 28 pages from? You're right. That's a very common misperception that they're from the Commission report. They're actually from an inquiry that came before that. Before the 9-11 Commission, there was a joint inquiry conducted by the two intelligence communities of Congress. And this inquiry was looking specifically into intelligence community activities before and after the attacks. And they did their analysis and their investigation in 2002 and you know, interviewing many, many witnesses and going through government files and so forth. And uh, that work culminated in a report spanning more than 800 pages. Now, throughout that page, that there's 800 pages, there's various redactions of a name or a place or a date. Uh, but then suddenly you get to this last chapter of the report and uh, the entire chapter is completely blanked out. So in the context of all those other small redactions, it's quite extraordinary. And this chapter deals specifically with the topic of foreign government connections and support indications of that uh, of the 9-11 hijackers. What I found interesting in particular when looking at this was indeed the bipartisan set of testimonials we have from people who have read the 28 pages because apparently, by and large, if you're a U.S. congressman, you can go in there and read them. You can't take notes, can't have anybody with you, you can't have any electronics with you, and they monitor you, but you can read the 28 pages. And I have to say, maybe my Catholic uh, listeners will will get the reference, but trying to get to the bottom of what this is all about reminds me of the mystery surrounding the third secret of Fatima. There would be this handful of people who had seen the third secret of Fatima, and they would slightly hint at what it was all about, and based on those hints, people were trying to reconstruct what it was. And in the, in the same way, we get these fleeting hints as to what's in there, uh, and, and we're trying to reconstruct what it is. But I think it's clearer what's in the 28 pages than in the Third Secret of Fatima because the references to Saudi Arabia are so open and blatant and repeated in the testimonies. How could it not be about Saudi Arabia and its government? Yes, that's one thing that's pretty clear. And in particular, former Senator Bob Graham, he was chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee and co-chaired that inquiry that produced the 28 pages. 
he's been uh, the most outspoken in pointing that finger. And he said that the 28 pages point a very strong finger at Saudi Arabia as being the principal financier of the 9-11 attack. So you don't get much stronger than that. So yes, every indication is that this is uh, linking the 9-11 hijackers to Saudi Arabia. All right. Now, even though we have, and I'd like you to read a few of them in a few minutes, even though we have testimonies about these 28 pages with hints as to their content from people who are fairly respectable people, yet it still seems, I bet, to some people as if there's something weirdly conspiratorial about all this. And I want you to explain why there's nothing oddball about asking for these 28 pages and why it does seem like something's going on here. Right. Yeah. I'm, sometimes I'm asked, is this a conspiracy theory? And I say, no, this is really a transparency theory, a theory that the American people deserve to have information about an attack that was devastating in its own right. But then when we look at the implications, the policy decisions, both uh, at home and abroad that have flown from that, uh, they're enormous. And we all deserve to know exactly what happened, what led and what enabled uh, the 9-11 attacks. So this, and as you said, there are many, many sober uh, individuals who are uh, championing this cause, former senators, former members of the 9-11 Commission, uh, significant figures in media, uh, nine, the uh, editorial boards of many newspapers. This is a, a very nonpartisan quest for transparency and the government sharing information that we all should have. All right. G- give me some uh, examples of things that have been said. I mean, give me the actual quotations from people who have read these 28 pages. Absolutely. You know, you mentioned Thomas Massey at the beginning as being a very uh, measured individual in his rhetoric and so forth. And uh, it was watching a, his press conference that actually initially sparked my interest in this. And uh, seeing him say that uh, the 28 pages, you know, reading the experience of reading it was shocking. And he said, I had to stop every couple pages and try to rearrange my understanding of history. It challenges you to rethink everything. Yeah, now that is a fairly arresting quotation. He's not saying, oh, you know, it's it's a whole lot of hoopla about nothing. Don't get your hopes up. There, there's no valuable information to be found here. That's right. Um, another big Congressman Walter Jones, who is the leader of the declassification drive in the House of Representatives, uh, he said, it probably took me a good hour and a half to read the pages because I would have to reread certain parts of it that I just couldn't believe what I was reading. Yeah. Now, when you mentioned that he's leading the effort in the House to to declassify it, let's talk about that. What exactly can they do? Can they simply recommend that the president release this information? Is there some way they can force him to do it? What exactly is going on? There are a number of uh, avenues of attack on this. The main drive right now in the House is uh, House Resolution 14, and uh, listeners can read the text of that at 28pages.org. It urges the president to declassify the pages. So it is a a sense of the House. It is the body urging the president to do that. That's up to 70 co-sponsors. So that wouldn't force it, uh, but would exert strong political pressure on the president to do that. But there are other avenues. There are rules by which either the House or Senate can declassify information, even over the objection of the president. Uh, There's a a very rarely, if ever, used muscle, but it's it's an option that's out there. Uh, Congressman Jones, in addition to uh, HRS 14, has introduced HRS 779 this month. That one calls on the chair and ranking member of the House Intelligence Committee to just personally declassify the 28 pages by putting them into the congressional record. Um, listeners may recall that the Pentagon Papers were classified, were starting to be leaked by the New York Times, and then Senator Mike Gravel actually entered them into the congressional record and put them into public view under the protection of the speech or debate clause. So that, that's another avenue that could be out there. Right now, though, we're really hoping that you know the shortest line to having these pages declassified is simply for the president to go ahead and authorize that. Now, on that front, we are in the midst of a review, a de- intelligence community declassification review that the president allegedly <laughs> requested in the summer of 2014. I say allegedly because it really uh, tests one's uh, credulity to think that it could take two years now to review just 28 pages of information. But we are now awaiting that 
they had said that they expected that review to be complete by the end of June, and uh, as you know, we're in July now, and uh, there'll be a press conference on Capitol Hill tomorrow uh, to draw attention to that and to reaffirm the you know, demands to get these, these 28 pages released. In your FAQ over at 28pages.org, you have the basic question, among others, what do the 28 pages cover? And I just want to read, read your answer for the uh, listening audience. According to the introduction to the chapter, which is itself an unclassified version of the actual introduction, the 28 pages cover the joint congressional inquiry's development of information, quote, suggesting specific sources of foreign support for some of the September 11th hijackers while they were in the United States. And then it looks as if basically the entire chapter has been blacked out. Whose decision was it to black out that entire chapter? That was the decision of George Bush, George W. Bush. There were months of negotiations between the staff of this joint congressional inquiry and the administration over how much redactions there would be uh, back and forth. And the Bush administration just would not yield on this chapter uh, dealing with for indications of foreign government support of the 9-11 hijackers. As your listeners may well know, there are you know, close ties between the Bush administration, Bush personally even, and the royal family of Saudi Arabia. Now, is it, can we know that we're only talking about Saudi Arabia here? We can't know anything uh, for certain. I, I believe there may be uh, additional countries implicated, perhaps. Sometimes you see some... Again, getting back to you, you referring to Fatima and the analysis of all these comments, sometimes you see plural references uh, by people referring to these 28 pages, but it's not clear if they're just being intentionally vague. Plural references meaning governments with an S. Exactly. Yeah, but they might be just be intentionally vague with that, so like saying some people or something like that. But uh, uh, it's not clear. It, it is pretty clear, though, that the overwhelming weight of this chapter uh, deals with Saudi Arabia. All right. Now, of course, I can anticipate what one of the objections will be. We can't let you know about what we uh, have learned about possible funding sources for the attacks because that would jeopardize national security. I want to ask you that uh, after we thank our sponsor. All right. If you're like me, you're overwhelmed with email. You get more email than you can possibly deal with. It's constant. It never ends. You wake up in the morning and somehow you got 50 emails while you were asleep can't possibly keep up with it all. What in the world are you going to do? Well, lose your mind is one possibility, but another possibility is a thing I use myself and I can't possibly function without anymore, and that is SaneBox. SaneBox automatically separates out the stuff I actually need from the stuff, well, let me put it politely, I don't really need. That way I can scan it a lot faster, do what I need to do a lot more quickly, and I can clear out my inbox every day using all the little tricks they have. For instance, if there's some email that I know I'll be in a better position to deal with in a couple of days or a week or whatever, I just have SaneBox resend it to me at that time. And then it's out of sight. I don't have to worry about it anymore. Fantastic. Get a 14-day free trial at SaneBox.com woods. And if you decide to stick with it, you automatically get a $25 Tom Woods Show discount. Don't let another moment of your life be stolen by too much email. Check it out at SaneBox.com slash Woods. So what is the response to the claim that national security might account for why they don't want us to have this information? Well, the best response is from people who have read and wrote the 28 pages, and they say that it's absolutely not justified. They said 95% of this chapter in this report could be declassified without any concern for, for national security. The rationale for this classification has evolved over time. Originally, it was to protect sources and methods for national security, just as you say. And recently, we see comments about the 28 pages as being, well, it's uncorroborated information that's unvetted. You know, that's an entirely different rationale that's now being floated about. I see. Okay, so it's not it's not credible in some way. Yeah, the national security justification is not credible. Yeah, exactly. But but I mean, but to claim that the information itself is not credible so, sort of leads you to wonder what it was doing in the report. Why why do they have this whole chapter 
how did it make it through? Exactly. It's a, a report of over 800 pages, and no one has ever made those kind of aspersions about the rest of this report, and suddenly you're supposed to get to this chapter that's just flimsy grab bag of information. You know, it's not the case at all. You know, this is information that came from FBI and CIA documents that the inquiry discovered. Do you know if Senator Rand Paul is one of the people who's read the 28 pages? He has read the 28 pages, and he has it introduced a Senate counterpart to that House Resolution 14 called Senate Bill 1471 that likewise urges the president to declassify the pages. Okay. Now, let's uh, let's talk about this a bit more. Why couldn't Senator Paul, or for that matter, any of these people, Thomas Massey, anybody, why couldn't they just give a speech telling us everything that's in the 28 pages? I think that's what people listening to this will wonder. Isn't there an obvious solution to this? Somebody just tells us what's in there. Exactly. Under the speech or debate clause, Members of Congress would indeed be protected from any criminal prosecution by revealing the information that's in the 28 pages. Now, there's a couple considerations that go beyond that, which is, number one, they can't take physical custody of the 28 pages. They're locked in a secure facility in the basement of the Capitol. Uh, so then they would have to recount as best that they could, I guess, the highlights of the 28 pages from you know, the floor of the House or the Senate. They would be protected from prosecution if they did that. They would not be protected from consequences. And one of those consequences could well be that they never again are granted access to read classified information. Now, anybody who on Capitol Hill is really driven to want to expose this classified information is probably the kind of person who would really value having continued access to other classified information so that they can stay informed and monitor the executive branch and so forth. So. Uh, it's it's not just as easy as saying, well, just go read it, because there could could be uh, repercussions from that. OK, it, it does seem to me that there you would think there'd be at least one person who would just be a martyr for the cause and say, you know what? Wouldn't be the end of the world if I did something productive and uh, left political life and went to the private sector and just did this for my country. You know, why isn't there an Edward Snowden in this case? Why? why there's nobody who will just tell us what's in here. If it's that important that it's just shaking Thomas Massey to his core, then why doesn't he say, maybe there's more important things than my congressional career? I mean, I, I don't mean to put him on the spot. I just use him as an example. Exactly. Um, and of course, I don't expect you to answer that. I guess that's more rhetorical than anything else. But if we're talking about something that's this important, then I, I don't see why your congressional career matters more than us having this information. Right. And maybe these people are wanting to go you know, as hard in the paint as they can right now using other avenues, using pressure on the president, using uh, resolutions and that type of thing to bring about political pressure. And there have been some indications that uh, reasons for optimism on this. There have been uh, statements by the administration saying we do expect some degree of declassification. We had the uh, CIA director this month uh, saying, uh, I think the pages should come out. I think it's a good thing that they come out. So I, I think we're seeing some... Uh, hints that there will be a declassification, hopefully a complete declassification. We recoil a little when we hear them talk about some degree. Uh, again, just about every word, according to people who read these 20 pages, should be able to come out, except perhaps for a few you know, names of a source or two. Brian, I don't, I don't know how any of this works in terms of government documents, but isn't there a possibility that they could release a falsified version of the 28 pages and we'd never know? That's a great question and one that's often asked. The, uh, the good thing is that we have... People on Capitol Hill who've read the 28 pages and were struck by them. We've got uh, people from the Joint Inquiry, Senator Graham, who chaired it. We've got watchdogs. The people who are advocates on this issue are the people who've read the 28 pages. So if somebody tried to make a last second swap uh, of the most compelling and important aspects of this, our watchdogs on Capitol Hill would know that. Let's suppose it does say something that implicates the Saudi government in some way in the attacks of 9-11. I don't understand the national security. I mean, I'm sure there's, if I had half the idea of what's really going on behind the scenes, I'm sure even I would be shocked. But if the claim is it could undermine, in general, the idea, I mean, I'm sure there are other claims, right? That there, there are ways we gather information might be made obvious in the 28 pages, whatever. 
But I could also see them saying that it would undermine the, the status that Saudi Arabia enjoys as a, as a great and important and unquestioned ally of the U.S. But it seems to me that begs, in the traditional sense of the term begging the question, that begs the whole question because the 28 pages themselves may show Saudi Arabia to be not so good an ally. So this argument collapses in on itself. Exactly. Last summer – when he was on the campaign trail, someone asked Senator Lindsey Graham, one of the most hawkish people on terrorism, uh, if he had read the 28 pages. He confessed he had not, uh, and then asked if he would declassify them. He said he would hesitate to do so if it would hurt Saudi Arabia. And it gets back to the circular logic of our national security establishment on this. Well, we don't want to do anything to hurt the Saudis. They're a key ally. Well, to the extent they are <laughs> implicated in the worst attack, uh, terrorist attack on U.S. soil, are they indeed that ally? That's really the fundamental question that underlies all of this. Now, you, know, you get to the question of why, beyond national security, why is this protection of Saudi Arabia apparently afoot? And really, it's part of an enormous pattern across both parties, across many branches of Congress, of protecting this relationship with Saudi Arabia at all costs. Uh, and you, that points to the influence that Saudi Arabia has in this country. And the more I've been involved in this issue and in this campaign, the more I, every day I uncover, oh, and there's another connection to Saudi Arabia. The uh, chairman of the, one of the largest Republican super PACs is a registered lobbyist for Saudi Arabia. Donald Trump's new, newly promoted campaign manager was a registered agent of Saudi Arabia. Uh, the money that flows into our uh, think tanks Comes, comes from Saudi Arabia. You've got multi-million dollar contributions to the Clinton Foundation from Saudi Arabia. So the connections, uh, that plus the enormous weapons deals that are done uh, with that, uh, the intelligence community's close relationship. Uh, you, sometimes we call, they call Saudi Arabia an ally. Uh, sometimes I think the better term where the CIA is concerned is a co-conspirator. <laughs> the, uh, uh, the con this is not an exercise in history, by the way, getting these 28 pages out. It's very relevant to today. Senator Graham says that by shielding Saudi Arabia from scrutiny of its role in 9-11, we've only encouraged them to continue funding and promoting extremism around the world and paving the way for the rise of you know, the menace of ISIS that we're facing today. Brian, I'm curious about your own background. Uh, what is your background and how did you come to be so involved in this issue? My background uh, originally is a, is a, I was an army officer for four years. I worked in financial services, then became a, a freelance copywriter. Uh, and two summers ago, I just happened to come across video of Thomas Massey on a Capitol Hill press conference describing the 20 pages and his reaction to it. And at that time, and uh, this is an issue you and, and Ron Paul talk about often, I had personally been on a quest to find my role, my niche, what can I do to help make things better? And uh, foreign policy a, had been an issue of mine of great interest. Transparency had been an issue of mine. I re started researching the top of the 28 pages. I saw a void out there. There was really no uh, single website with information, reliable, well-sourced information, ongoing reporting, original documentation, and so forth. Uh, and so I decided this is this is this will be it for me right now. I'm going to leap in and, and make this my avenue of of attack and a little brush fire of the liberty out there. Well, it's tremendous. Tell people the website again, and what do you want people to do after listening to you talk right now? What's the action step you want them to take? You bet. Come to 28pages.org. It's 28pages.org. We have uh, resources there to help you take action, and it only takes minutes. We've got the enormous influence of the intelligence community and Saudi Arabia on one side, and it's the American citizens on the other in terms of pressuring the president. There's this declassification review going on right now. They'll tell you it's a, a national security review. It's really a political review. They're measuring political costs and benefits of declassifying these pages. So we need to exert as much pressure as possible. So come to 20pages.org, click the Take Action button. Uh, we can guide you through making a quick phone call to uh, your uh, member of the House, your senator, the White House. We've got, if you want, if you prefer sending a written message, we can facilitate that as well. The other thing I would say is stay plugged in on this issue. This is a kick the can exercise by our government. Keep deferring this. It's been uh, 13 years since this report uh, was created. 
And so stay connected. Follow us uh, on Twitter at 28 Pages. Uh, you can also link to us uh, and find our like our page on Facebook from from our website. So stay hooked in, stay interested, and share this information uh, with those in your social circle so that, to build awareness of this so that we can really bring this about ahead of this 15th anniversary of the attacks that's coming up very soon. I'm going to link to everything you just mentioned, the social media, the site itself, uh, over at tomwoods.com slash 692, which is our show notes page for today. Brian, best of luck with this. Uh, you took me from somebody who knew – I don't know, half a sentence worth about this stuff to somebody who I feel like I could now hold my own in a discussion with someone on it. So I'm grateful to you. You have indeed found an important niche, and we all appreciate it. Thanks so much. Thank you, Tom. All right. Now let me update you on things here. We still have, if you haven't started listening to the Contra Krugman podcast, which I co-host with Bob Murphy at ContraKrugman.com, well, that will help get you through these light weeks in terms of Tom Woods show episodes while I move across the country. So remember, the episodes are going to be a little sporadic until then, but we're going to get at least a couple a week, maybe three a week, depending on how well I do. But before you know it, uh, well before the end of the month, we will be back to five episodes a week of the show. But you always have Contra Krugman that you can check out at ContraKrugman.com. Well, anyway, coming up on the July 18th episode, I don't know what number episode that'll be, but Tom DiLorenzo has a brand new book coming out on socialism, and it's called The Problem with Socialism. And it's a wonderful book that goes at the subject from a bunch of different angles, and it's a very needed book in light of Bernie Sanders' success and the resurrection of the term socialism and the idea of socialism in our own day, especially among young people. So that's going to be a really great episode. It comes out July 18th, and Tom will be on the show on July 18th. Uh, no matter what's going on with me and my move, that is a definite. You can pre-order Tom's book at Amazon through tomwoods.com slash socialism. And I, I want to note that if it weren't for my little team here, I wouldn't even be able to do the episodes I'm doing during this move. Uh, we're, you know, we're moving to Florida. I've told you that. But thankfully, I've got Chris Williams on audio. And you can check him out, by the way, for audio services at chriswilliamsaudio.com. He's incredibly conscientious, an exceptionally hard worker, extremely knowledgeable, just top notch. I just, I couldn't be happier with Chris. A.J. Van Slyke, my assistant, AJ, is a tremendous guy. You may have heard him in a, a an episode of this show that we did some time ago, uh, the two of us together, uh, talking about his role and, and how he got into the, uh, the liberty movement. Uh, again, without AJ, there's no way I could be doing anything during this time. Kirsten doing the transcripts, uh, transcripts of all the interviews are a perk of the Supporting Listener program at supportinglisteners.com. I appreciate her. Everybody who's doing my web guy, Connor Boyack does tremendous work for me. It's a it's a great team. It's just an amazing team. I've got also some tech stuff being done by Anthony Mione. It's it's amazing. I can't do these things, but these people do them for me. And you help to make this all possible when you do your Amazon shopping through TomWoods.com slash Amazon. It doesn't cost you anything extra, but it helps me pay some bills around here, particularly for these totally, totally indispensable people. All right, let's see. Robin Kerner is coming up on episode 693. That should be just a couple episodes, I beg your pardon, a couple of days from now. And we're going to talk about persuasion and winning people over and the liberty movement and the blue Republican movement that Robin really got started. Uh, all kinds of fun and important and truly necessary things on number 693. Thanks for listening. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free, and we'll see you next time. A nine this month. That one calls on the chair and ranking member of the House Intelligence Committee to just personally declassify the 28 pages by putting them into the congressional record. 
Um, listeners may recall that the Pentagon Papers were classified, were starting to be leaked by the New York Times, and then Senator Mike Gravel actually entered them into the congressional record and put them into public view under the protection of the speech or debate clause. So that, that's another avenue that could be out there. Right now, though, we're really hoping that, you know, the shortest line to having these pages declassified is simply for the president to go ahead and authorize that. Now, on that front, we are in the midst of a review, a de intelligence community declassification review that the president allegedly <laughs> requested in the summer of 2014. I say allegedly because it really uh, tests one's uh, credulity to think that it could take two years now to review just 28 pages of information. But we are now awaiting that. They had said that they expected that review to be complete by the end of June. And uh, as you know, we're in July now. And uh, there will be a press conference on Capitol Hill tomorrow uh, to draw attention to that and to reaffirm the you know, demands to get these, these 28 pages released. In your FAQ over at 28pages.org, you have the basic question, among others, what do the 28 pages cover? And I just want to read, read your answer for the uh, listening audience. According to the introduction to the chapter, which is itself an unclassified version of the actual introduction, the 28 pages cover the joint congressional inquiry's development of information, quote, suggesting specific sources of foreign support for some of the September 11th hijackers while they were in the United States. And then... It looks as if basically the entire chapter has been blacked out. Whose decision was it to black out that entire chapter? That was the decision of George Bush, George W. Bush. There were months of negotiations between the staff of this joint congressional inquiry. The Tom Woods Show, episode 692. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, if your email inbox is running your life, it's time to get your sanity back. Do what I do and use SaneBox. That's S-A-N-E-B-O-X. Get a 14-day free trial at SaneBox.com slash Woods. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here. Today, we're talking about the 28 pages do you know what the 28 pages are? Well, you will after this episode if you don't already. The 28 pages are an entire section within an official report of a joint inquiry conducted by the House and Senate Intelligence Committees published in December 2002. This entire section has been blacked out. Now, some people have been allowed to read this section. This is a section this is about 9/11. And some people, like U.S. congressmen, for example, have been permitted to read these 28 pages, and apparently they have something to do with a government or governments that may have lent some assistance to the 9-11 attackers. So it's, of course, an interesting subject, and Senator Rand Paul has been behind an effort to declassify the 28 pages. So we're going to talk about the 28 pages and the controversy surrounding them, and we're going to do so with Brian McGlinchey, who runs 28pages.org. That's 28pages.org. He is a freelance writer. He's the founder of 28pages.org. He's a former Army officer and a financial services executive. And he joins me right now to talk about the 28 pages. Brian, thanks for being here. It's great to be with you, Tom. I've been reading 28pages.org since I knew we were going to talk. I knew a little something about this 28-page thing, but not a whole lot. I was quite surprised by the comments. In way, we get these fleeting hints as to what's in there, uh, and, and we're trying to reconstruct what it is. But I think it's clearer what's in the 28 pages than in the Third Secret of Fatima because the references to Saudi Arabia are so open and blatant and repeated in the testimonies. How could it not be about Saudi Arabia and its government? Yes, that's one thing that's pretty clear. And in particular, former Senator Bob Graham, he was chairman of the Senate Intelligence Committee and co-chaired that inquiry that produced the 28 pages. He's been uh, the most outspoken in pointing that finger, and he said that the 28 pages point a very strong finger at Saudi Arabia as being the principal financier of the 9-11 attack. So you don't get much stronger than that. So yes, every indication is that this is uh, linking 
the 9-11 hijackers to Saudi Arabia. All right. Now, even though we have, and I'd like you to read a few of them in a few minutes, even though we have testimonies about these 28 pages with hints as to their content from people who are fairly respectable people, yet it still seems, I bet to some people, as if there's something weirdly conspiratorial about all this. And I want you to explain why there's nothing oddball about asking for these 28 pages and why it does seem like something's going on here. Right. Yeah. I'm, sometimes I'm asked, is this a conspiracy theory? And I say, no, this is really a transparency theory, a theory that the American people deserve to have information about an attack that was devastating in its own right. But then when we look at the implications, the policy decisions, both uh, at home and abroad that have flown from that, uh, they're enormous. And we all deserve to know exactly what happened, what led and what enabled uh, the 9-11 attacks. So this, and as you said, there are many, many sober uh, individuals who are uh, championing this cause, former senators, former members of the 9-11 Commission, uh, significant figures in media, uh, 9 the uh, editorial boards of many newspapers. This is a, a very nonpartisan quest for transparency and the government sharing information that we all should have. All right. G give me some uh, examples of things that have been said. I mean, give me the actual quotations from people who have read these 28 pages. Absolutely. You know, you mentioned Thomas Massey at the beginning as being a, a very uh, measured individual in his rhetoric and so forth. And uh, it was watching a, his press conference that actually initially sparked my interest in this. And uh, seeing him say that uh, the 28 pages, you know, reading the experience of reading it was shocking. And he said, I had to stop every couple pages and try to rearrange my understanding of history. It challenges you to rethink everything. Yeah, now that is a fairly arresting quotation. He's not saying, oh, you know, it's it's a whole lot of hoopla about nothing. Don't get your hopes up. There, there's no valuable information to be found here. That's right. Um, another big Congressman Walter Jones, who is the leader of the declassification drive in the House of Representatives, uh, he said, it probably took me a good hour and a half to read the pages because I would have to reread certain parts of it that I just couldn't believe what I was reading. Yeah. Now, when you mentioned that he's leading the effort in the House to, to declassify it, let's talk about that. What exactly can they do? Can they simply recommend that the president release this information? Is there some way they can force him to do it? What exactly is going on? There are a number of uh, avenues of attack on this. The main drive right now in the House is uh, House Resolution 14, and uh, listeners can read the text of that at 28pages.org. It urges the president to declassify the pages. So it is a, a sense of the House. It is the body urging the president to do that. That's up to 70 co-sponsors. That wouldn't force it, uh, but would exert strong political pressure on the president to do that. But there are other avenues. There are rules by which either the House or Senate can declassify information, even over the objection of the president. Um, there's a, a very rarely, if ever, used muscle, but it's, a, it's an option that's out there. Uh, Congressman Jones, in addition to uh, HRS 14, has introduced HRS 77. By Thomas Massey, Congressman Massey from Kentucky. You know, he's a pretty sober and, uh, you know, restrained individual in his rhetoric, and he is blown away by the contents of the 28 pages. Let's start off with what these 28 pages actually are. These are not pages uh, redacted from the 9-11 uh, the Commission report. I bet I think people probably think that's the case. What are these 28 pages from? You're right, that's a very common misperception that they're from the Commission report. They're actually from an inquiry that came before that. Before the 9-11 Commission, there was a joint inquiry conducted by the two intelligence communities of Congress. And this inquiry was looking specifically into intelligence community activities before and after the attacks. And they did their analysis and their investigation in 2002 and you know, interviewing many, many witnesses and going through government files and so forth. And uh, that work culminated in a report spanning more than 800 pages. Now, throughout that page, that there's 800 pages, there's various redactions of a name or a place or a date. Uh, but then suddenly you get to this last chapter of the report and uh, the entire chapter is completely blanked out. So in the context of all those other small redactions, it's quite extraordinary. And this chapter 
deals specifically with the topic of foreign government connections and support indications of that uh, of the 9-11 hijackers. What I found interesting in particular when looking at this was indeed the bipartisan set of testimonials we have from people who have read the 28 pages because apparently, by and large, if you're a U.S. congressman, you can go in there and read them. You can't take notes, can't have anybody with you, you can't have any electronics with you, and they monitor you, but you can read the 28 pages. And I have to say, maybe my Catholic uh, listeners will will get the reference, but trying to get to the bottom of what this is all about reminds me of the mystery surrounding the third secret of Fatima. There would be this handful of people who had seen the third secret of Fatima, and they would slightly hint at what it was all about, and based on those hints, people were trying to reconstruct what it was. And in the, in the same way,